Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the March edition of the Roundtable. My name is Mark Robertson. I am joined here by Ken Kavula, Cy Lynch, and hopefully Hugh McManus. Uh, Ken, have we heard from you again yet? I have not heard anything since he tried to get on, had significant technical issues, and, and left us. So uh, I'll kind of keep an eye out for him uh, during the session, and if he shows up, I'll give him whatever help I can from okay. uh, remotely here. One, okay. one thing you might do is watch for him to call in. Sometimes when he's okay. on the road, he actually will phone in, if you can watch for him okay. amongst the, the attendees. And Cy Lynch is taking a break from spring training to join us. Greetings, Mr. Lynch. Good evening, Mark and everyone. All right, so I think we'll just dive right into it. I've entitled this a little bit of March Madness in honor of all the bracket stuff going on these days. But uh, one of the things you are going to see, and in fact, even with Ken Kabula's selection of Neogen, they're all kind of related to the, the food and healthcare industry tonight. So I just stuck a couple of uh, images up there. Um, the FDA approval slide, by the way, goes back to a presentation done by Hugh in a two-part series a couple years ago. It's quite good about watching for opportunities in the biotech and uh, early pharmaceutical uh, stages. And the, the pipeline remark is there for that reason. Uh, you might go back and take a look at that. I will include a link to those uh, sessions in the, the notes for this session on our forum and in the stuff we put out online. But again, welcome everybody. We'll get our uh, legal paperwork out of the way here. Again, no investment recommendation whatsoever is intended. This is all about education. It's to demonstrate and use for illustration some stocks and our method of analysis that goes literally goes back 50, 60, 70 years now of how we actually take a look at companies, build expectations, and, and, and build our shopping lists around the highest quality companies possible. Here's our standing agenda. Again, uh, welcome to all of you uh, that have been here before, and a special big wel welcome to those of you who might be joining us for the first time. We do try to keep this fairly casual. Ken will open up the floor for questions. Keep in mind that we do leave time at the end for questions and answers, so that can also be something that we do. We'll take a quick look at the performance results. We do take this pretty seriously. We do try to bring ideas that are actionable and uh, beat the market from the time we pick them. Ken's going to feature Neogen. I'm going to do Celgene. Uh, Hugh, if he's able to join us, is going to do uh, apparently a mystery stock. And uh, Cy's going to double down on Biogen. And we always uh, do. Mark. Yes. Uh, Ken did send us an email uh, indicating he was having connection problems. He, he did say his mystery stock is BP, so he decided to buck the drug. So, so our pharmaceutical expert is bucking the drug industry and going with <laughs> oil. Right. Oil. You know, he's kind of stuck in that oil patch, and uh, he's actually doing quite well in the oil patch, as usual. Okay, so we'll, have, we'll do BP for the mystery stock. Okay, again, just a quick reminder is what we're trying to do. The four of us, we are often joined by guest damsels and guest knights as part of this. We're all just trying to share an idea. And uh, we do like that idea to um, beat the market from the time that we bring it before you. Um, we do like, we'd like to see the combined collective uh, performance of the portfolio, the tracking portfolio, beat the Wilshire 5000 by five percentage points. That's 500 basis points for those of you that speak that language. We do like to see you know, more than half of our selections outperform the market. And that, the, that is our objectives. Here's a quick look at our performance to date. Again, nearly six years now of doing this on a monthly basis. Our rate of return for the tracking portfolio, this is the actual annualized rate of return, is 11.8%. And 52.2% of the selections have outperformed the market. Just to give you a kind of a benchmark or a context for that outperformance accuracy, the average investor actually only beats the market with a selection between 30 to 40% of the time. And uh, so we would love to be in that 60% range. 52 is good, but we'd like to be a little bit higher. But again, anything above 50 is actually pretty exemplary. And uh, the all-time performance at 11.8 is pretty good. But most importantly, we compare that to the Wilshire 5000, that actual return, subtracting out a mirroring or matching investment in the Wilshire 5000 is what we call relative return. We'd like to beat that uh, Wilshire 5000 by five percentage points. That's the red line. That's also the, the most common objective of most investment clubs. They're trying to beat the market by five percentage points 
over the long term. You can see the trend is pretty good. We are uh, seem to be headed in the right direction. And uh, interestingly enough, five out of the seven uh, knights and, and damsels are in positive territory when it comes to relative return, and the other two are just barely negative. So I look, I look forward to the day when we're seven for seven and when it comes to that part of the characteristic too. Any questions or comments at this point, Ken? No, we're staying pretty current, Mark, so keep on plugging away. All right. I'm not going to spend a lot of time with the portfolio tonight other than to point out these are some of the stocks that have been picked over the last five years. Some of them are multiple selections. The, the, the URL up at the top is the, the link. It's a public link to the dashboard, which gives you all the selections made. What we do is we, we invest $1,000 into every stock brought here as a recommendation, whether it's audience or Cy or Mark or Ken or Hugh or one of the guest damsels or knights, we actually invest $1,000 into it at the time of selection. So some of those are m many time selections. Cognizant, for example, has been selected 12 times. So $12,000 has become $19,000. And you can see that has been our by far our favorite selection. And uh, it actually represents 6% of the tracking portfolio. We do keep track of every single decision made, but... Uh, uh, Mark, I will point people to the Clubhouse column in the most recent Manifest newsletter. Uh, I did a kind of a deep dive into this portfolio, and instead of looking at the top uh, where, you know, where the many times chosen stocks congregate because there's a thousand dollars per choice so they move up because of value i looked at the stocks that had been chosen only once or twice and it was really interesting that our percentages our our picks uh really moved up on, on a lot of these single choices uh, maybe sometimes i'm wondering if the seven of us get a little bit stubborn <laughs> Uh, when we when we pick things three and four and five and six times, some of our best work is done down at the bottom of the chart, and it doesn't reflect in the portfolio as much because we don't choose it as much. But uh, some of our one-time, two-time, three-time choices, uh, our percentage of accuracy is much much greater down in that area of the of the chart. So take a look at that article. It's again, it's the clubhouse house article in the latest manifest investing newsletter right on the front page i'll include a link to that also in the notes tonight you know one example of that might be the ticker symbol egov egov the company's nic that you can see kind of two-thirds of the way down the page i'm pretty sure ken that's a two-time selection so two yeah, it's, either, it's it's one two or three it's not very uh, much money in it but it's really really done quite well, extremely well. Uh -huh. And that's an example of it, probably a doubling or close to doubling since the time of selection. So again, these are the ones that contribute the most powerfully to the, the all-time performance, so we can't ignore them. But Ken is right, you know, fishing for some of those things, like the company that I bring tonight, you know, will be a, a one-time, first-time selection, and, you know, you should probably uh, listen to that very carefully. All right, let's go ahead and uh, head into our stock presentations. And Ken wants to deal with one of our Michigan local favorite sons, uh, Neogen. Well, uh, the only uh, regret I have about picking Neogen, Mark, is that I, I wish the roundtable would have been yesterday. Uh, all the numbers you're going to see, folks, uh, come from l last night and this morning. Uh, and un unfortunately, fortunately for those of us that own the stock, but unfortunately, if you're trying to get into it, Neogen went up almost 8.5% today. Uh, I haven't found a good reason why yet. Uh, I really haven't had the time to take a look, but uh, I'm a happy owner of Neogen. Herb Lemko, one of the mid-Michigan directors, is in the back room with us this evening, and he's also a, a happy owner of Neogen. In fact, an awful lot of people in Michigan, this company is uh, headquartered in Lansing, Michigan, and they're extremely friendly to their investors uh, and to investment clubs around the state. Uh, their, uh, their IR guy does a lot of traveling, and he'll visit your club and spend an evening with you. Uh, it's just a, a really nice outreach program for this relatively small company. Mark, you want to give me a click uh, to the next slide? What you're looking at in the next eight or 10 slides is right directly from a, an investor presentation put together by uh, Neogen. 
and it starts with a with a pretty strong mission statement. Uh, and they really don't just write a mission statement. They add absolutely believe this. Uh, they want to be the leading company in the development and marketing of solutions for food and animal safety. And there have been so many times uh, over the last 10 years that I've owned this stock where Neogen has been in the forefront of, of guarding against some common things that have been happening. We had an E. coli scare with the spinach crop uh, about seven or eight years ago, and Neogen products helped move us out of that particular scare. Neogen uh, is really committed to creating products that will help keep the food for human beings and for animals uh, very safe. Click again, Mark, if you would. Uh, you can see that it's about 50-50 uh, in food safety for humans and in food safety for animals. Uh, not only food safety for animals, but things that will make animals themselves uh, safe enough. Uh, you can see the revenues are a little bit more to the animal safety side because of the extra 4%, but uh, about 50-50 uh, as far as we're talking. And it's a, a relatively small company. Uh, it's had great growth, uh, but it still stays small. For those of you that haven't heard, Better Investing has altered its uh, division numbers for the sales numbers for small, medium, and large companies, uh, now uh, Better Investing is, is deciding that a small company sells $1 billion or less in product, and a large company sells $10 billion or more, and that means medium-sized companies sell $1 to $10 billion. Uh, the percentages uh, that you can expect for that kind of growth, though, remain the same. A small company, you can expect to grow at 12% or better, and a large company, you can expect to grow at 7% or less, and in between those two numbers is what you can expect for a good, solid, medium-sized company. So those numbers should be part of your uh, uh, the back of your brain, and they should be included as you consider almost anything with any stock that you're taking a look at. Click again, if you would, Mark. Uh, Neogen's a food safety uh, company, and you can see all the different areas that they work in, uh, from veterinary in instruments to instruments you might use in a school cafeteria to sanitation supplies that you might use in a dairy. Uh, they even make dehydrated culture media, which is used in, in many laboratories, even though today uh, that's a business that is... Uh, uh, eventually going to be taken over by other methods. There are still thousands and thousands of labs that, that uh, uh, do cultures of various uh, bacteria or whatever, and they do it in a very traditional way, the same way that Lister did it uh, way back in the 1800s. Click again if you would, Mark. Uh, they're in three divisions, Neogen is. One of the divisions is the intervention products. Uh, they figure that they have access to about a billion dollar market in these types of products. You can see them listed over on the side. Uh, Neogen is uh, one of the leading road side manufacturers in the world. Certainly doesn't sound real romantic, but it's a product used uh, almost anywhere that you have human beings and almost anywhere that you, you grow and process food. Uh, they figure growth in this particular uh, segment of their business at 5 to 7%, and right now Neogen has about 12% of the world's uh, market share in this business. Obviously, some uh, fairly decent growth in some pretty mundane products. Click again, Mark. Here's that culture that they make, this AccuMedia dehydrated culture media. And this is sold throughout the world uh, to traditional labs that are, are doing research, uh, especially research with bacteria and uh, related animals like that. Click again, Mark. Here's their fastest growing product area, and that's diagnostic products. Again, another $1 billion potential market, Neogen controlling about 12% of it, and the growth here at maybe 8 to 10%. Now, what I've been describing are the different ways that Neogen grows organically. Uh, in all three of these markets, Neogen finds ways to uh, 
to create product and to grow its business organically. So you get a somewhere between a, an eight, nine, ten percent organic growth rate uh, from these three business segments. Click again, Mark, if you would. Uh, their strategy for growth is to expand market share. We'll talk about that a, a little bit more in just a moment. Uh, they're very uh, aware that they need to continually be developing uh, new products, so they put quite a bit of their, their money into research and development, and they're, they're constantly bringing out new products uh, for either animal safety or for food safety. Uh, they do grow by acquisition, and that would give them an extra 2 or 3% uh, or more growth, uh, depending on the year. Remember, when you're reading an analyst's opinion about growth going forward, most analysts will not include uh, an acquisition until it actually takes place. They won't include it in their analysis. That's especially true of some of the big sources like ValueLine and Morningstar. And we're going to see that Neogen, uh, while... Uh, they're not going mad with acquisition. They certainly are not afraid to add to their stable of products when an acquisition makes sense. And then this expanding market share is focused extremely uh, laser sharply uh, on international growth. Uh, they feel that two thirds of their future growth uh, will be coming internationally uh, with a huge amount of it coming from India. Uh, they're, they're making large strides to move into India and to uh, deal with the kind of products that, that India could use. So again, two-thirds of their future growth uh, they expect to be coming outside of the United States. Click again. Uh, here's some, some things that Neogen has developed on its own. These are their own products. Uh, they, they carry patents. They carry a long list of different patents. I find these interesting, some of these, because I saw them being used in our own school cafeteria, for example. Uh, when they cleaned the cafeteria at the end of the day, uh, this instrument at the top of the page, that's a swab that little uh, thing that looks like sort of like a, a blue hypodermic, that's a swab and you swab your surfaces and you can test how clean those surfaces actually are. Uh, there's a lot of other tests that Neogen develops. Uh, their strategy is to move into areas where the big companies uh, don't find a large enough business to make it profitable for them and then to dominate that little niche here and that little niche over there. Uh, I would suggest that at some point, Neogen is going to be uh, such a great little company that it's going to be a target of somebody uh, for acquisition purposes. Uh, I don't care if my companies get bought, as long as they get bought at fair prices, that gives me a nice profit. But meanwhile, for the last I'm going to say 15 or 18 years, I'm glad to take the profit that I've been taking from Neogen. Uh, this stock does carry a pretty pricey PE uh, average, so when you're doing your stock study, uh, you, you might have a pause uh, because of the high PE values associated with, but the company comes through with stellar growth to match that kind of PE. Another click, please, Mark. Here's their acquisition history since 2000. There have been 32 accretive acquisitions. You can see the dollar amount of these acquisitions. And uh, there's not a year that's gone by since 2000 where the company hasn't bought one or two or three different small companies or one or two or three products from other companies. Again, with the idea of filling a niche where the large players in the field uh, would not find it profitable to, to make a, a foray. Uh, click again, Mark. Uh, I told you before that they see two-thirds of their future growth coming uh, internationally. Right now, international sales are 35% of total sales, and Neogen says that in the next five years, they would expect international sales to uh, move way past 50%, and they're targeting somewhere around 60, 65% of their sales coming from international places. Uh, you can see that that they're uh, talking in their in those bullets beneath the graph 
Uh, they're telling you some various things uh, where they think the international growth can come from. Uh, they especially like the fact that in many of their, their new markets, uh, there's a changing regulatory environment. Uh, that means the uh, laws are getting stricter, and as the laws get stricter, you need tools then to meet whatever those standards happen to be, and that's what Neogen is in the business of doing. You can also see the stellar rise in revenue uh, over the last 15 years or so. This company just keeps marching right along with revenue increases to match its earnings increases. Click again, Mark, please. Uh, here's the sales line, the earnings line, and the pre-tax profit line that we're so familiar with. Uh, those dotted lines going forward uh, are my projections for growth. And basically, I'm projecting at about the same rate that Neogen's been growing for the last, and this shows 10 years, but the, actually this growth uh, has been uh, pretty consistent now for about 15 or 16 years. So I'm predicting that growth to continue. It's still a, a pretty small company. I don't think that the law of large numbers will begin to really, really impinge on the company uh, during the next five years at least. Notice that Neogen's also trading, or it was when I captured this screenshot, it was trading near its 52-week low, like so many healthcare companies that we're, we've been looking at. Uh, I did mention, uh, if, you're, if you just came into the broadcast, that today Neogen was up 8.5%. I don't have a reason for that yet, uh, but that's a significant move forward, uh, and it's not reflected in these, uh, these pictures that I'm going to show in the next couple slides. Click again, Mark. Uh, here I'm looking at pre-tax profit on sales, and this is coming from the uh, Better Investing uh, tool, the SSG Plus tool, and uh, I don't like to be a slave to these colors. I know that they're pretty, and, you know, red means good and green means, uh, I'm sorry, red means bad and green means good and yellow means stable. Uh, I like to kind of take a look at the numbers themselves. I do notice that the 2014 pre-tax profit, for example, is higher than the 2013, and it's only off of the five-year average by a half a percent. I like to compare the profit back, you know, nine, ten years, uh, and I'm looking way back at the beginning of the data array, and I see that the pre-tax profit has increased. So. I would not be dunning this uh, because the graph is red next to it. Uh, the same general thing is happening on return on equity, and this is a pretty clean return on equity number because the company carries virtually no debt uh, of any kind and has it for a significant period of time. Uh, click again, Mark. Here's the bottom of that SSG, and this is before the price raise today. I had it in the buy zone. Uh, I will tell you that that it's, uh, you know, the, the PEs that I uh, uh, think are, are pretty uh, uh, realistic uh, are, are reflecting in the buy, but if, if you're more conservative than I am, uh, you might not be anywhere near a buy, especially after the price has moved up as much as it has in the last 24 hours. One more click, Mark. Uh, I'm looking at a return before that price move of somewhere between 13 and, and uh, uh, 15 percent, 13 and 19 percent there. And if we click again, we're going to see an eagle. Uh, this is from Manifest Investing. An eagle is nothing more than a a, uh, a series of numbers that, that mimic what the SSG does. Notice this eagle is using a PE ratio, an average PE ratio of 40. It's in the, the last column about halfway down is that 40. Uh, that's about the same P.E. ratio that I used uh, average on my SSG. Uh, that's nosebleed territory for a lot of folks, but uh, the sales number is very close to what I anticipated sales to move at, and you would then expect that the projected return would be very close, and in fact, it's right in the middle of that bracket. This eagle validates my SSG. It, it kind of 
that verifies that I'm doing a, a pretty decent job when I get numbers that kind of cluster together uh, between my manifest study and my, my SSG study. And I, you know, I like to look at the standard sources and, and they're all telling me that this company should be able to achieve uh, uh, potential uh, growth uh, somewhere uh, in the maybe 12 to, to 16, 17% range. Uh, again, that's before the price, but uh, nevertheless, uh, I'm going to add it to the portfolio this evening, uh, and thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Thanks, Ken. Yeah, I did some digging and tried to find, uh, you know, some of the motivation or fuel behind the price ramp up, and there's really nothing. I mean, uh, or a small amount of insider purchasing, a couple thousand shares. Um, it really got hammered by Kramer in the street a couple weeks ago, and as you know, it's dropped from 60-something down to 45. So it could just be a little bit of a bounce. Um, but there really isn't much of anything. If anything, some of the expectations have been uh, blunted a bit online. So it's kind of a mystery. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll take a kind of bounce like that almost any day you want to bounce it to me. So. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So, again, not a whole lot of uh, – things to sink our teeth into on it, but I was expecting to see some type of an analyst uh, coverage initiating with an upgrade or something along those lines, but it wasn't there. Uh, sure. Lorraine wants to know where you get the numbers for the Eagle, and Lorraine, if you go to the Manifest Investing site under the Research tab and you click on My Studies, uh, the, the Eagles fill themselves in default uh, using the numbers that Mark has collected from the, the various uh, uh, sources that he uses. You then have the ability to change those numbers. If you think the sales growth is too high, you can lower them. If you think the, the average PE going forward should be higher or lower, you can change that. And you can adjust the eagle to fit what your feelings are. What are the sources of the numbers ultimately? Well, they're the standard sources that most of us use. They're uh, uh, Morningstar and Value Line and Standard and & Poor's and, and all the other places that we go to research our stocks and to listen to what other people have to say uh, about what's going on. That would even include better investing and, and looking at member sentiment. Uh, you know, I, I would, when, when I can look at 200 SSGs that were done in the last 30 days and get a, an average member sentiment growth number uh, for earnings, uh, I think that's a useful number. Now, if they've only done four SSGs, that's, that's probably something you don't want to want to spend a lot of time with. But uh, I, I think you can, you can do a lot of that stuff. Uh, I'm getting from Marie. Uh, Re-neogen volume was very high today compared to average trading volume. Uh, I would expect that to be true with the price spiking. In fact, I like to see the price going up on high volume. I don't like to see huge price moves on very, very low volume with a stock. Uh, and uh, Mark, you're going to have to answer this one from Lorraine. What does Eagle stand for? <laughs> Okay, it was just simply equity analysis guide. Um, if you want to get cute, it's to long-term expectation. Um, so equity analysis guide is what it amounts to. And all we're trying to do there is is something that we've believed for a long time that if Mr. Nicholson, the founder of the modern investment club movement, were around, he would probably be encouraging us to use the terminology stock selection guide a little bit less because it's really not a shopping tool. It's an analysis tool that not only is used for shopping, but also for maintaining and, and practicing good stewardship with the stocks that we own. So, again, Mark, it's an equity analysis Mark, guide. Lorraine wants to know, are there places on the Manifest Investing site where you can find out how to use the Eagle? Oh, yeah. If you just if you uh, do a quick search on, on Eagle, I'll go ahead and, and, and put some links in on some Eagle demonstrations in the forum. Okay. And I, I should say to Lorraine also, Lorraine, I'm eager to write clubhouse columns on anything that people would like to know about using manifest investing. Uh, so if, if I get a couple of folks that really would like a column on how to use the Eagle, I'd be glad to walk people through. I've written columns similar to that before, and you can find those by searching. But 
uh, it's always uh, good to re, you know, to revisit a topic and to look at it in a slightly different way. So uh, if you'd like a, a clubhouse column on that in the next couple of months, just drop me a line or drop Mark a line and we'll put it on the list to try to get it covered. Absolutely. Well, thanks, Lorraine. All right, I'm going to go ahead and shift gears and take over now. Um, I, I basically put together a really quick screen of 16 stocks that rank in the top percentile of manifest rank at manifest investing. And what that simply is is a combination of the quality ranking for a company along with its return forecast in the firm in the form of a projected annual return. So we basically weight those two characteristics equally, and then we basically rate uh, rank that index. So anything that you see here on this list ranks in the top 1% of all the stocks that we cover, about 2,400 stocks in the total manifest investing universe right now. So you see from uh, Akamai down to Perigo, um, some fairly interesting companies with fairly robust uh, return forecasts. Most of those are in the, the mid-teens to high-teens, so those are, those are pretty pretty good when the average stock is down around 7 or 8%. Quite a few quality ratings up at the very top echelon. Those are all excellent quality companies, all ranking in the top almost, with a couple of exceptions on the list, the top 10 uh, percentiles of uh, quality, again, measured by some key characteristics against their peers. So this is where I want to start my shopping, as if I were going shopping with real money, but making my selection here tonight. So I thought I'd break it down and show how I might uh, take a little deeper dive into this list and try to uh, filter out and identify the one that I might go after. I referred to it as filtering the chaff here, uh, starting with the very one at the top, all those characteristics we just had at the top. Uh, a projected annual return of 17.6 that you can see here. Uh, again, that's very robust, almost a little bit frothy. A very solid uh, quality ranking of 98. And then the the relative strength index is not something that I use that much, but some, some of you out there, especially those of you who subscribe to the Hugh McManus technique of shopping near 52-week lows, this is a similar concept. Relative strength index is what the RSI refers to. And that's what's shown on that price chart down below. Um, some people like to shop when companies are oversold. And uh, oversold is when the relative strength index gets down around 30. So again, I was just looking to see if any of these might be down in that 30 range. In the case of Akamai, you can see that the times when it was down in the 30 range, 30 to 40 here, were these low points. And again, that would have been a nice place to pick up shares of Akamai. And in fact, just two to three months ago, there was pretty good opportunity and uh, I think we did feature it in a couple of different places. The value line forecast is pretty good, too, at 17%. But here we hit uh, applying the ointment. Morningstar, even at that price, does not think that the Akamai is on sale. They think that it's a little overpriced. That P to FV, that's price to fair value. So uh, if the price was equal to the fair value for the stock, that would be 100 So we're basically looking for a company that has a, a price to fair value less than 100 It'd be really cool to find one in the 90 or 80% range. And you can see that uh, Morningstar does not believe that Akamai is on sale at the present time. Um, Standard & Poor's did not have an opinion on a price to fair value. And, these, and then we close out with three fairly uh, short-term, one-year outlooks from the analyst consensus estimates, a 10% expected return over the next year. Standard & Poor's checks in at 8%. And the one-year Rhino, this is a compilation of Goldman Sachs and Merrill Lynch and, you know, Morgan Stanley, basically anything with Morgan in it. Uh, the more powerful uh, institutional analysts and, and money managers on the street. And again, these are these are fairly low numbers, uh, eight to ten percent. You can probably find some companies in the twenty to thirty percent range that have a little more shorter-term uh, momentum. If you want to think of the, the next year in that way. So I, go, I went ahead and threw uh, Akamai off the list, and here's the rest of the companies. We can just take a, a look at them from top to bottom and and uh, see what I might have done with some of these. Again, I'm just looking for, you know, again, a company that might have a relative strength down in the 30s. Uh, I would love to find a company that, that Value Line loves. And you can see some very decent return forecasts here in the middle of the page. And then notice that uh, Morningstar believes the rest of these companies are pretty much on sale. Again, anything less than 100% would be considered to be on sale. And uh, uh, 
all of these companies pretty much fit that bill for the ones that do provide uh, Morningstar coverage. Notice that some, uh, many of the names, uh, Celgene, um, they've come up in other discussions. We had that list up earlier. We'll show it here in a few minutes again, 52-week uh, lows. Biogen is on this list, so I will be presenting that tonight. Um, a number of re fairly recent Ken Kavula favorites are on here. That that feels good to me, too. He's got a pretty good track record around here. And uh, Polaris is on there, Buffalo Wild Wings. Proto Labs is one that we've been looking at over the, over the last several months. Cognizant, again, some, some pretty strong community favorites. Um, I'm influenced by, you know, anytime somebody like Goldman Sachs is really negative for the next year on a company like Illumina. Um, might look good for the long term, but I might want to sit back and wait for a, a better price point. Notice that uh, Standard & Poor's also believes that Illumina is not necessarily on sale at this point. Uh, the other thing that I kind of look at here is the, the ones that are designated RT are already in the roundtable tracking portfolio. So again, that might be something which would sway me. So what, you know, basically what I'm going to go with is Celgene because I like the return from value line, decent quality rating. Again, not quite perfect on the relative strength and certainly not perfect on the value line. Low total return. We'll talk more about that. But everybody else likes it. Morningstar likes it. S&P really, really likes it. They think that it's 38% on sale. And notice that the analyst consensus, standard and pours, and the, the power rhinos all have a very good outlook for the next year. So I'm going to go ahead and go with Celgene off of this list for my, uh, my March selection. Here's a look at the company. Um, notice pretty much up straight and parallel with a little bit of volatility, the type of thing that you would come to expect from a biotech slash uh, emerging pharmaceutical company. The, the Fave 5 that's on there and that link refers to the fact that Celgene has been fairly recently selected for what we call our Fave 5. We put out five stock picks every Thursday night or Friday morning, and uh, Celgene has appeared on that list. Um, that list is performing quite well, and I'm interested in tracking that over the long term. But uh, again, really decent business model analysis here, visual analysis, and you can see that uh, it's a fairly interesting company, certainly at a glance. Here's a little more detail on the numbers themselves. Um, the value line numbers that, that I'm showing here are from their January 8th. They'll be updating next week. Uh, the January 8th edition with, with the stock price at $119.10. Using a growth rate forecast of 11 or 12%, projected net margin of 30, and a, a PE ratio of about 25, they came in with a single digit, uh, call it 6 to 7% return forecast, uh, based on those assumptions that are shown there. An update today is, again, the stock price is 20% off from uh, January 8th, so that's going to help us a bit, a little bit more sales. Um, this 16% growth rate forecast, that's really where the where the flies in the ointment here when it comes to the value line lower expectations. If you look at the, the long-term picture here for Celgene, um, the more recent years here from 2012 to 2019, they do check in at, you know, Take your pick, 14, 15, 16, even 17% growth on the right-hand side of this graph. So you're not out of line uh, picking at least a, a low teens growth rate for the company. The projected net margin, I've actually put the, a picture of how it's behaved over the last several years. You can see that they hit a, hit a speed bump of sorts in 2015. That was related to some uh, hiccups with some acquisitions. They do a fair amount of acquisitions. Um, but again, over the long term, we see a trend that, that certainly supports the possibility of being in the upper 20s, low 30s, and perhaps even climbing back to 40, which would be a real bonus. I only use 27 and a half. For the PE, again, I stuck with the 25. I think the, the PE of 25 is defensible for such a large industry leader. Uh, what do they do? They're basically in the field of cancer stuff, cancer solutions and uh, immunotherapy. That kind of stuff. They've uh, they've got a real strong global presence, a strong pipeline. So I just put them in the in the category of the biotech that's focused predominantly on cancer solutions. And uh, I think all of us have pretty much been touched at some point by by that. So again, using my assumptions, you're looking at uh, a return in the mid-teens. Um, certainly, pretty good situation considering that the average stock right now, again, is down in that 7 to 8% range. 
One thing that does flag for many of us is the fact that uh, they do have a fair amount of long-term debt as a result of some of these acquisitions over the years. But when you dive in a little bit deeper, and you can actually do this at Morningstar, if you click on the, their bonds page, you can actually see specifically what does the debt look like. And in the case of Celgene, you can see that anytime they've reached out to borrow money, they've gotten it at uh, some pretty good rates there. Anything from 1.9%, the, the high is 5 So, again, you're looking at an average rate of somewhere around 3%. Again, a financial strength rating of A-plus. The banks like to loan money to these guys, and uh, they, they rank in the top 3 percentile for financial strength at Manifest Investing. So it's a pretty much a consensus situation. And... Uh, Again, something to think about. Again, we, we counsel for beginning investors to avoid companies that have such a high debt amount. But again, think about the effective interest rate here. It's relatively low. This is an attractive company to loan money to. They are financially strong. And uh, that is an exception that we can make to that rule for experienced investors. So that's going to be my pick for, for this, uh, for the March roundtable. And uh, is Hugh actually with us now? Hugh or, or, or Ken? I don't see him anywhere, Mark, at the moment, so let's move to Cy, okay? Okay. We'll come back to this and take a look at this at the end of the night. We just thought it was kind of interesting that Hugh likes to shop near 52-week lows, and there's so many healthcare stocks here. He was going to feature BP tonight. But we'll go ahead and move to another healthcare stock, one that showed up on our screening results, and Cy is going to take us back to a repeat of uh, Biogen. Take it away, Mr. Lynch. Uh, all right, thank you, Mark, and, and good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, as we've already uh, mentioned, I am featuring Biogen tonight. Uh, Ken and myself and the audience all picked uh, Biogen as uh, selections in our January uh, roundtable. So um, it, it, uh, you can go back to that presentation if you want to see a little bit of uh, detail that Ken uh, did a very good job of, of talking about the company, but Biogen is a biotech, a biotech company primarily focusing on um, multiple sclerosis, uh, anti-cancer drugs, and um, uh, uh, Alzheimer's drugs. Uh, they've got a, an Alzheimer's a, uh, drug in phase three trial, the primary driver of their current revenues uh, are multiple sclerosis drugs, and then in between uh, there uh, are some uh, blood cancer uh, leukemia uh, drugs. So that's that's the business that Biogen's in. As you can see, historically, uh, good sales growth uh, for a larger company, along with uh, decent prof pre-tax profit and uh, earnings increases as well. Uh, let's move to the next slide, Mark. Uh, what I wanted to uh, talk about tonight is uh, as I usually do on roundtables, is where I, I came up with my selection uh, for tonight. And I kind of thought that I would call my presentation tonight the busy investor's pick. Um, what I've really discovered in the last three years, those of you who uh, know me know that I am finishing up my third year of seminary uh, as a full-time student. Uh, I also work uh, part-time uh, as a minister uh, in a church, uh, working primarily with youth, as well as just general life things, doing roundtables and trying to uh, manage an investment portfolio uh, as well. So uh, I do not have as much time to spend uh, with investment uh, decisions as I once did when that was much more the focus of my uh, vocational work. Uh, and even uh, before I had school on top of, of work. Uh, and this past week has been particularly busy. Uh, also, if you're a roundtable uh, favorite, you know that I like doing repeat picks uh, as well. So what I did tonight is I took the roundtable portfolio. I ranked uh, it from top to bottom with uh, by par. Uh, projected total returns and essentially went down and picked a stock that I had previously selected. And Biogen uh, is the highest par value of a company that I, I selected. Uh, one 
reason that I did that uh, is probably ego-driven. Obviously, my picks are good picks, uh, I would think. Uh, but the real reason is, and what what I wanted to use as the illustration and teaching point tonight is, is Biogen as a company because I have picked it. I also happen to own it, so I follow it a, a bit. It's a company that I tended to know a little bit about. I know either from pr previous presentations or from some general knowledge, you know, uh, somewhat familiar with many of those stocks uh, above, but I am most comfortable with Biogen. And that's, uh, I know Ken talks a lot in many of his presentations about how a club or an individual investor, how you can shop off your current portfolio or off a watch list that you've already done your extensive stock studies because you're already comfortable with the company and comfortable with, uh, in particular, the quality uh, aspects of the company. So then you can rely on um, uh, manifest and other sources for potential total return uh, information. So that's where uh, Biogen came out and noticed very solid quality um, characteristics, a 90 uh, a quality rating putting it in the top 10 percentile, and the financial strength, which again, given where the market is right now, I like particularly biased toward financial strength of 80% and above. So Biogen fit all of those criteria. So that's where I came up with Biogen. But again, I don't want to buy solely based on numbers. I want to make sure there's nothing going on since my stock study or something that maybe I've missed. So let's move to the next slide, Mark. Uh, this is an area that uh, Mark often talks about uh, and I like uh, to do is uh, take a look for potential red flags. Uh, we've already talked about how the uh, uh, stock market as a whole, how Wall Street tends to be a little bit skeptical about big drug companies uh, for a number of, of largely political reasons or political concerns. This is from Finance Yahoo. It is the uh, analyst estimates uh, page on Finance Yahoo, and I'm just checking to see what the trends are here. And if you actually notice, uh, Biogen had some downward trends that you don't see on this slide. Uh, this is just what I know from following the company. Had some downward trends in the latter part of last year uh, that drove the price down. But if you notice the current trends uh, for the March quarter, uh, that they're just about ready to uh, close out and report are actually trending up a little bit over the uh, last 90 days. Same thing for the June uh, quarter and for this fiscal year. So actually the trends uh, are all up uh, slightly, nothing hugely significant there, but, but uh, uh, no uh, major bad news uh, on the company or that you're fearful of. Notice there is a slight dip from uh, 2019 to uh, $20.07 here December 17th, but that's almost too small to even uh, be significant at, at all, and it looks like that was just one uh, of 24 analysts that lowered uh, their estimate and, and brought that median down just slightly. So again, nothing here alarms me about the company. I also checked the news uh, feed briefly to see if anything's uh, out there, and other than Jim Cramer bashing the company, there's nothing particularly uh, alarming out there. Uh, a little bit of um, uh, concern about um, uh, their major uh, multiple sclerosis drug uh, in the uh, European uh, Union, uh, Tecfidera. Uh, the European Union did shorten the patent protection by uh, four years from 2028 to 2024, 20, uh, but again, most analysts have covered said that's already been baked into the price, so that's not a significant news, although the U.S. Patent Office is reviewing it uh, as well. But uh, again, those sorts of things are not unusual, but that's what's been going on with Biogen. So no alarming news is out there to, uh, uh, to scare me off the company. Next slide. So here are my judgments. This actually is the um, eagle uh, with my personal judgments added in. That's a uh, Ken showed you the eagle form from the My Stock Studies 
on manifest investing with the default uh, values for Neogen, uh, one of the features uh, of the eagle is that everywhere you see a green uh, indicator that Mark is highlighting now on the screen, you can actually adjust the judgments and place your own uh, in, which I have done on this eagle. These are the same judgments I used in January. Uh, again, no major reason to change them, but doing my uh, busy investor uh, story tonight, I left them the same. The only thing I updated was the price. And you see um, my annual sales rate was 8%, which is a little below uh, the consensus and, and below what uh, uh, Mark and Manifest is using as their uh, consensus based on uh, the analyst. The net margin is uh, 27 is uh, uh, slightly above, again, um, a manifest Solomon uh, consensus, but that tends to balance out with the sales. Uh, PE forecast that I use is about the same, uh, leading to a projected annual return somewhat lower than the manifest default uh, that you saw earlier uh, that was in the 17% range, but still a very healthy 13.8%. Um, so uh, Biogen is my uh, repeat pick uh, for March and uh, my selection for tonight. And so all busy investors out there, please vote for Biogen. Let's uh, <laughs> double down on it. We're all busy. That's why I solicited busy investors, Mark. That hits everybody, doesn't it? It does. All right, Ken, unless there's – why don't we go ahead and take care of the poll first? I don't – unless Hugh has shown up uh, – I don't no see signing. him yet. Uh, he may, no. He may be actually traveling, so we'll go back and take a look at his 52-week uh, low list here in a few minutes, but I, I'd say go ahead. Um, okay, well, let me get the polls ready to go here. Uh, and I'm going to launch the poll. Here it goes. I like running in these primaries where there's fewer candidates. It, it, it tends to bump my numbers up a little bit. <laughs> This one should be an interesting horse race. Kind of waiting here. Uh, we have 80% uh, voting. All you have to do is take your mouse and uh, click next to the stock you think you'd like to add to the portfolio. I'm going to give you about 10 more seconds. We're at 80% voting. Now, remember, baseball season is uh, well underway in the spring and ready to start full-time next week, so click B for baseball, bio. <laughs> well, we or basketball, March Madness. We got people campaigning now, huh? Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay we're up to 80, uh, 83%, I just, I, and I'm going to close the, the uh, polls, and I'm going to share the results, and there are the results. So it looks like Neogen squeaked out a victory rover over Biogen right there, and uh, somebody liked British Petroleum, even though we uh, we didn't present it. And uh, we have five percent of our audience feeling that they're not real fond of any of these stocks and here. So I, I did I get more than five percent this time? You you're up to twenty this time, Mark. One out of five. <laughs> You're doing fine, okay. All right. If you like uh, it, I will serve. All right. <laughs> I'm going to hide those results, and now we're back to, to your uh, screen, Mark, and that was just a placeholder they're looking at right now. Yeah, that's last month's results, and I am um, I'm holding the audience accountable for only giving me 5% last month. By the <laughs> way, I think Stifle Financial is the best performer in that group. Hint, hint. All right. <laughs> All right, here's some of the coming attractions before we open up the floor for, for questions. Uh, I, I put the uh, the Cincinnati Investor Fair on here. There's probably a few people from Cincinnati here. They're having a, a, a Saturday educational event on April 23rd. Alan Holdsworth, one of our friends from Illinois, will be over making a presentation in Cincinnati, and you can find more details on that at the Better Investing website for the Oki Tri-State chapter in Cincinnati. Uh, I've, I've been to that fair a number of times, Mark, and they do a real fine job. So if you're anywhere near, uh, you know, take that, take the time and go to their fair. They do a real, real nice job there. Good bunch of folks down there. 
And then, uh, as we've told you before, most of our roundtables are going to happen on Tuesdays this year, and the April event is a month from now on April 26th, same time, same bat channel. Ken, do you want to share some thoughts on Pittsburgh and Chantilly? Well, we're going to, Mark and I are both going to be at Pittsburgh. Uh, we're going to uh, try a joint keynote address. We're, we're not sure how that's going to quite work yet, but we're going to give it a stab. I'm thinking like a tug and of war, you know, some kind of like a like could, tug of war. That could work. That could work real well. We're going to going to meet uh, day after tomorrow to try to plan some of this out. And we're like also a... going to spend a couple of hours doing two guys talk stock. That's always a real popular program. So join us in Pittsburgh on April 30th. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Cy and Hugh and Mark and myself will all be in Chantilly, Virginia. That's a suburb of Washington, D.C., very close to Dulles Airport. And we're going to be at the BI National Convention from uh, Thursday night, May 19th, all the way through Sunday morning, uh, the 22nd. So we'll have lots of different programs. Uh, we'll be doing a roundtable uh, from the convention. Uh, we'll also be doing a ticker talk uh, from the convention. Uh, plus, Mark is teaching a lot of classes. I'm teaching a lot of classes. So is Hugh, and so is Sai. So uh, it's great to see a lot of you at those types of activities. So come on down if you get a chance. If you can only come one day, uh, they do offer one-day tickets to the convention, and you can get a, a real good look at what's going to be happening every single day by going to the Better Investing website. Mark, you're going to be on the Wall Street on Water Alaskan cruise, aren't you? Yes, we are. Um, Wendy and I will both be on that, and uh, that's uh, mid-September. That's an event actually sponsored or organized by the Puget Sound chapter out of Seattle. The, the, the cruise originates in Seattle. It's uh, kind of been on our bucket list for a number of years, so we're treating it that way. There's a number of educational sessions that will be presented. I'm going to actually use the investor's manual, the individual investor's manual as an outline and present a series of presentations using the chapters of that book. I'm kind of excited about what that might do. Obviously, we'll be bringing that also to Manifest Investing, but that will be part of the handout materials for the people who join us on that cruise. And I just look at it as an opportunity to spend some, uh, you know, unhurried time going over some of this stuff and helping people and a number of people have already signed up for it. So again, if you want more information on that, you can use either the, the Puget Sound Better Investing uh, chapter page or send me a note and I'd be happy to hook you up with the people that uh, we can help you there. And we have, have published some details on it in the, the newsletter and we'll do, we'll do some and, more. And, and I'll, I'll tell you, Mark, the fresh salmon barbecue uh, is worth the entire trip. So, uh, if nothing else, folks, if you like fish, the fresh, fresh salmon barbecue on the ship is just absolutely wonderful. They come right out of that cold water, and they put them right onto the grills, and, and boy, are they wonderful to, to snack on. And we, we share with the grizzlies, apparently, huh? <laughs> so, Mark, we do uh, have a few questions. Uh, do you want to put an official close and then get the questions answered. You want to do it that way? Yeah, let's go ahead and we'll close down tonight. Well, in fact, we'll just kind of sign off with this one again and in, in tribute to uh, Hugh McManus. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to join us, but this is a fairly intriguing list. Hugh spends a lot of his time shopping for companies that are near their 52 week low that still have very strong quality characteristics and decent return forecasts. And many of the companies on this list, list fit the bill. In fact, when I ran the the, the screen, I thought I had accidentally hit the healthcare sector button. Uh, as you as you look down that list, it's just kind of uh, affirmation that that we were all kind of shopping in the right place tonight, at least according to this. We might have to wait a little while because uh, there's not a lot of momentum in this area right now. But uh, if, there, if, if Hugh has nothing, he has a lot of patience. Genius in disguise is what he calls it. And uh, again, it's... Uh, it's an area to, to give some deep thought and some shopping. There's a couple banks in there down at the bottom and a couple food uh, companies mixed in, but everybody else is uh, kind of an intriguing healthcare company and uh, probably portends that there's some shopping opportunity in that sector. So we'll I'll put this list out in a couple of different places, but uh, it'll be in the PowerPoint Mark, form. 
our model club just conducted a, a pretty comprehensive study of, of different uh, medical companies that offer different types of services in, in clinical settings. And if you want a real pretty uh, SSG to take a look at, uh, I would uh, focus folks on about halfway down that column on Mednax, uh, ticker MD, uh, with a quality rating of 100 and a par still in the sweet spot. Uh, that's a real pretty looking SSG. Mm -hmm. That's the one that rose to the top of our study. And in fact, the, the model club in mid-Michigan here purchased uh, some Mednax a couple months ago and added to that position uh, one month ago. Yeah, and of course, the other the other giveaway there is the earnings per share stability is 99. So this is a, it's got some straight lines yep. on yep. the business model analysis. Yep. So again, we'll uh, go ahead and make that available also. And I think I'll go ahead and do an official sign off. Again, thanks to all of you who contributed here tonight. And hopefully the, we gave the audience some actionable things to chew on. <laughs>